Hi there, everyone, and welcome to the RS and the Wellbeing Week. Um, I'm joined by a very special guest today, uh, someone who's worked I've followed for a long time. It's, it's, it's Darren McGarvey. I am Andy Stevenson, just quickly introducing myself, and the Director of Learning and Engagement with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. Um, Darren, uh, thanks for joining us, mate. My pleasure. Tell us a wee bit about yourself, that'd be great. My name's Darren McGarvey. I uh, am a, I'm a writer, um, a commentator, broadcaster, and also a uh, hip hop artist who performs under the name Loki, the Scottish rapper, and uh, you know, you, you, you might have heard of me under one of those guises already. You might not have, there you go. Fantastic. Um, yeah, maybe a good kind of icebreaker to kick things off. Um, what is music to you? Wow. Well, um, I know it's a big I question, mean, but... <laughs> you, no, it's, it, it's actually quite simple for me. I mean, I'm, I'm 37 years old. And I don't remember a time where I didn't have music in my life. Um, I mean, it's, I associate it with the positive aspects of my upbringing. I associate it with key milestones in my, in my personal life. And as well as that, music has given me a focus and a continuity, uh, particularly in my adolescence when a lot of other aspects of my life were kind of spinning out of control. I was obsessed with music, I was obsessed with creating music, participating in the local music scene, and, and this concern seemed to override all others, even, even addictions. Um, music was the only thing that I could do, no matter what nick I was in, and that remains the case. It means everything to me. Fantastic. I, I guess something I mean, from your answer there, I just, I mean, it's a real creative answer, which is amazing. Um, and something that I was really excited to talk to you about in general. Um, obviously, for anyone who is watching, some of our audience, obviously a classical, or a lot of our audience, a classical music audience. Um, Darren, you're a hip-hop artist from Glasgow, and I think that was your predominant vehicle for creativity early on, Darren, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I started off, I dabbled in... Um... Mu music. I, I was in a jazz band in school. Wow. What I did played you play? Trum trumpet for a while. Did you? Oh, trumpet. Wow. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. And a, a, a funny story about how I came to not play it anymore was you had to carry the instrument from school uh, back home every day that you had lessons. And uh, and uh, I got jumped one day. Gee, three Three uh... boys jumped me. And they stole the, the they stole the trumpet, but they didn't take the mouthpiece, which always really baffled oh, me. Man. And sort of it, it gave gave me an insight into into the kind of quality of some of the characters that I was dealing with in my <laughs> in my young days in Pollock. But it, it was always a struggle because in, in in the sort of community that I grew up in, uh, if you if you took a notion for any kind of activity that fell out with the, the the very clearly defined parameters of what is acceptable behaviour for a young male, then, you know, you always had a fight in your hands, sometimes literally. And so for me, what hip-hop provided after I had dabbled in a bit of guitar and drums, obviously trumpet, uh, I was big on theatre, I was big on drama, um, acting, but, but what rap and hip-hop provided me with was a space where it was possible for me to be creative, but also to kind of drape myself in a veneer of aggressiveness and and ultimately masculinity, which is a very important adaptation you have to go through in order to navigate safely many of these environments and uh, as a youngster. So it was a it was a middle ground for me. Fantastic. And then I mean I've read your book Bobby Safari, obviously all well winning and stuff title it's, it's a great book and mm. certainly from an outsider's observation you look at that social context and you look at your love for words and you look at this middle ground of creativity where you could have that veneer of aggressiveness as you put it so eloquently i guess yeah do you think yeah. that that was then the perfect vehicle for you to almost fulfill both strands like that public face but that creativity and that love for language Yes, absolutely it was, and um, I mean it sort of happened by accident, and what I realised was these were both legitimate facets of my nature, and so it was good to find a kind of, um, a, the, to be able to straddle that ravine, um, you know, sometimes more gracefully than, than others, but 
it was always it was always something I was attempting to do, and I think I carry that into my other work that I do now. Obviously, you know, my career is predominantly as a writer now, um, and I still feel that I have to bring that hip hop spirit into what I do. You know, the spirit of the battle, the the, the spirit of confrontation, of representing where you come from, of trying to be authentic. Um, these are all principles of hip hop, which are very important mm. and and become part of of who you are if you're ad- adhering to it as strictly as I yeah. try to. Fantastic, Darren. Um, very eloquent. Yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, I guess then the next maybe question, and I think it's quite pertinent to the experience we've all had as a people over the last couple of years, is during lockdown, did you find that your relationship with music changed? If so, how did it change? But what did you? I don't know. I can be as simple as did you explore new genres or fields of music? Yeah. Or? Well, I've always, I've always. Uh, if you go back and listen to my catalogue, even from the very, very first album, um, I was sampling Jamiroquai. Um, I was, I was sampling. I sampled Cheryl Crow on a song on my first album. This was unconventional at the time. This was unconventional. Um, because my other musical experiences and influences were, were coming into play in hip hop and being expressed in different ways, um, and and even speaking to classical music, um, I used to listen to the the Planet Symphony uh, in a room when I was maybe like eight or nine. You know, you got the, wow. the, the Gustav Holst cassette tape on the front of the uh, a magazine about the solar system or something. And I just loved it. I just it really transported me somewhere, and I still love it. Um, and uh, what else did I sample on my, my uh, an album in 2014? I did a kind of concept album about the referendum, and I think I sampled Philip Glass, part of his Watchmen wow. score, uh, in there as well. Because I feel like what what classical music can offer in terms of uh, when you're trying to create cinematic hip hop is a sense of scale and a sense of of, mm. of other worldliness. That obviously, you know, that, that that that's why you get composers doing movie scores, for example. But of there's course. no reason why you can't employ all that in, <clears throat> into your hip hop if you're trying to to transport a listener somewhere other than the locale. So, um, so you know, the, these influences, uh, even though they might not t- take literal form, sometimes um, I, 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 I listen to a wide variety of music. Obviously, Spotify and things like that have changed the way that we we listen to music. But in lockdown, what I found was my relationship, not just to music, my relationship to everything had to be re-examined and modified to deal with the new uh, demands and stresses and, and time constrictions, really. So for me, the, the, all of that um, was a case of, it was a case of learning to prioritise. And so more and more for me, music, despite it being my most obvious passion, is the thing that I have to set a specific amount of time to do once everything else is done. Of course. Because you've got family, you've got work, you've got your fitness, um, then you've got all your domestic tasks that you've of got course. to do as a dad. And then, you know, once all that's done, I sit down and I try and, you know, refine a verse or uh, listen to some production and, and make some decisions about it. The um, next question I was going to ask you was what role do you believe music plays in wellbeing? It depends on the context. I mean, you, you know, if, if I mean, we we are for whatever reason we respond as a species to harmony. Mm. You know, um, we respond positively to harmony. This could be visual harmony. This could be audio harmony. This could be social harmony, uh, relational harmony, sexual harmony. All of these things we respond positively. You know when. When a bunch of pieces, disparate pieces, sort of link in together and temporarily, uh, something is produced, and we take pleasure in that, or we, we we derive inspiration from that, and and so I guess the thing is, you know, to keep your eyes open for that harmony when it announces itself, because sometimes we can always be a bit too distracted from it um, by what's going on in here. You know, I mean, you just have to, we really just have to think, how much of our lives do we spend in a dialogue with ourselves? I mean, it's mad when you think about it, literally. Just rattling about it. 
Yeah, like I could be watching a video on YouTube that's all about seizing the moment, you know, and enjoying every moment while you're here and like shushing my kids on the floor because I'm trying to watch it, right? And it's like, the thing I'm missing is my kids. Do you know what I mean? So like, I'm not <laughs> yeah. learning anything from the YouTube video that's trying to tell me to be present and you never know and you, every day you're going, you no, know, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to do something for the last time and I'm like, kids, shush, I'm trying to watch this YouTube video about how it sees the moment of life, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you, you need to kind of, you need, you need to sort of, and also I think in a practical sense, you need to kind of streamline your life in a way that uh, all the things that are superfluous or that aren't serving you, um, whatever that might be, lifestyle choices, um, whatever, you know, sometimes you need to set aside time to examine what is undermining your well-being as well as, you know, just the natural ebb and flow of mental health. No, that's great, Darren. Thank you very much. Um, so what attracted me so much about working to the RSNO is that it's a, it's a national company that has is, is remit is literally to bring the right orchestral experience to every single citizen of Scotland and beyond. Every single person has a right to experience the RSNO in a way that's suitable to them, in a way that engages them in a creative way. What key barriers do you see on the ground to classical music for everyone? And what ways do you think that national companies like ourselves can really strive to transcend those barriers of deconstruction? Great question, by the way. Often you'll find things that are associated with the upper classes, um, they, they, they often require a, a big upfront cost in order to participate. And so this is how they become the exclusive preserve of people who enjoy a certain level of affluence. Um, now this is not to make a prejudgment on, on people who go to theatre, people no, who course, enjoy classical music, people who play. It, it, you know, a lot of people come from working class backgrounds and then, you know, but through hard work and good fortune, they end up uh, further up the food chain and that's absolutely fine. In a, in a poorer community, in a deprived community, this is one of the things that, that, that comes under the rubric of deprivation as deprived of cultural experiences and, and this is partly because it's, it, it, you know, costs a lot of money to buy a cello costs a lot of money to buy a trumpet. The schools can't always provide them. And then when they do provide them, you've got all the battle that you have to engage in just to be seen to be doing something that's not boxing or football. It helps to see it as part of a process. So, I mean, it, solving one problem always makes another problem more obvious, right? So you deal with the problem of affluence, right? Which is you make instruments more accessible. Then you have a cultural frontier to the problem, which is you have to consistently be providing those access points so that slowly over time the culture changes, right? And the culture changes when uh, someone from a poorer background becomes a noted player of an instrument or or makes and and so they they begin to model culturally what that looks like for someone from your background here is here is something to aim towards here's something to shoot towards and then you need people to to excel in something and then that's how you you you, you, you change the culture i really love how you speak so much about social almost the the context in which you existed and exist to a certain extent and the, the certain barriers and hardships as a result of that. Have you got any ideas on how we could help empower young people with that idea of self-efficacy? Yeah, I think for a company, what's important is that um, companies don't shy away from using their clout um, in order to lend their prestige or their resources towards pushing uh, for the systemic changes that we would need to see culturally in terms of uh, education, access to music, um, and uh, trying to help to r remove a lot of these barriers in education. And so, you know, it's important that companies and anybody who's kind of working in this area is not going to shy away from, uh, you know, linking up with other campaigns where it's relevant and, and, and not being afraid to throw its weight around a little bit because this is very important. No, that's fantastic. Um, no, Darren, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, the last thing I would ask you, for classical music, one of the biggest barriers is, it's, it's, as you said, the grandness of the scale and also the fact that there is no lyrics. It's hard to engage with. 
but it's actually just about letting it wash over you. So you spoke about using maybe yeah. coloured glass or the fact that you love the planet's holes. Are there any great examples then of sampling that allowed you to explore another genre? That's a good question, actually. Uh, Kanye West is an example, mm. particularly on his kind of late registration album. There was oh, a lot of classical elements example. in that. But I think Deltron 3030, the, um, their first album, uh, which was a kind of dystopia of the future, and th they managed to bring a sense of scale, and I think that was the first album of its kind, really, in hip-hop, where it was kind of almost... Mm. It was it, 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 it was a proper concept album, right down to the cover, everything. It sort of took you into that world, and in and, and sense of the scale, it still used all hip-hop elements, but it managed to create that grandeur that you can only really achieve through classical music. Um, so uh, that's definitely uh, one that I would, I would think of. No, that's, that's great, Darren. Um, just before I say, we, we wrap up and say goodbye, uh, obviously I want to say thanks on behalf of the RSNO. Not a problem, Andy. Okay, guys. That is a pleasure. See you later.